we have a crisis in the world, tremendous crisis, and also crisis in our consciousness, in us. I see the urgency of change, radical revolution, mutation in the mind. I see it. It is necessary. There is complete quietness of the mind, and that which is silent has vast space. Only then that which is nameless comes into being. This is Urgency of Change, the Krishnamurti podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 220 of Urgency of Change. This week's theme is jokes and anecdotes. Upcoming themes are quiet, patterns and formulas, and evil. The format of this episode is different to the usual selection of longer extracts. During the course of Krishnamurti's talks and dialogues, he would sometimes include a joke anecdote or parable, relevant to what is being said. This episode compiles a collection of 26 of these from the 1970s and 80s, each one being much shorter than the usual extracts featured on this podcast. In a special promotion, the Krishnamurti Centre at Brockwood Park in Hampshire, UK, is offering one free night for retreats of three nights or more. This includes both individual and group retreats, but not the larger Krishnamurti gathering that takes place in the summer. Please visit krishnamurticentre.org.uk forward slash programs for more information on the range of events we offer and to book. You can also use the link in the episode notes. This offer ends on February 4th, 2024 and is valid for stays throughout 2024, subject to availability. Now, over to Krishnamurti's jokes and anecdotes. Two men were walking along on a street, talking about various things of life, and one of them sees something on the pavement, picks it up. The moment he looks at it, his whole face changes. He's some, something tremendously had taken place in him. And puts it in his pocket very carefully in his inner pocket. And the friend says to him, what is it you picked up? What is, why have you become so extraordinary? Your face has changed. He said, I picked up truth. And the fellow and his friend says, but you, is that really so? I can see by how you look. So what shall we do about it? And the French said, let's go and organize it. <laughs> this is an old story, which a speaker in bed about 40 years, 50 years ago. I must tell you a very good joke. May I? This happens to be hell, and the devil is there in the distance. I'm not pointing at anybody. <laughs> the devil is far in the corner. You know, Christian devil with two horns and tail. And there are two people talking together. One says to the other, it's very hot here, isn't it? Hell, very hot. The other fellow says, yes, it's very hot, but dry heat. No joke. <laughs> no funny people. All right, sir. I've got lots of jokes. I can't be me. When we say we are aware, we are aware of things very, very superficially. Right? I am aware that you have long hair or short hair. I am aware of the colour that you are wearing. And I react to the short hair or the long hair. 
calling a hippie or non-hippie, square, you know, all the rest of it. I react to it. And my reaction is the response of my conditioning. The other day I saw a rather good cartoon in the New York, I think I saw it. There was a boy and a girl standing at a window looking out on the street, and two or three hippies were walking down the street. And the boy says to the girl, There goes the establishment. <laughs> Got it? I mean, if you have no conflict, no I, there's something else operating. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's important to say that because, you know, say the Christian idea of heaven as perfection may seem rather boring, you know, <laughs> uh, because there's nothing to do. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me of a good joke. <laughs> you waited for the joke? <laughs> <laughs> Man dies and goes to St. Peter. St. Peter is, says, <coughs> you, have, <coughs> you have lived a fairly good life. You have not cheated too much. But before you enter into this heaven, I must tell you one thing. Here, we're all bored. <laughs> <laughs> we're all awfully serious. God never laughs. And every angel is moody, depressed. <laughs> if, unless you want to enter this world, hesitate. But, he says, before you come in, perhaps you would like to go down below and see what it's like. And then come and tell me. It's up to you. So he says, Peter says, ring that bell. <laughs> Lift will come up, you get into it, go down. So chap goes, rings the bell, goes down, <coughs> and the gates open. And he's met by the most beautiful girls, etc., etc., etc. And he says, by Job, this is the life. Mm. So, and he says, may I go up and tell Peter? And so the, he rings the bell, gets into the lift and goes up. He said, so it was good of you to have offered me the choice. <laughs> I prefer down below. Mm. And Peter says, I thought so. Mm. <laughs> so he rings the bell, <laughs> goes down, opens the gate. Two people meet him and beat him up. Mm. Push him all around and so on. He said, he said just a minute. Two, a minute ago I came here. You treated me like a, a, a king. Ah, you're a tourist there. <laughs> Sorry. Talking of monkeys, sir, huh? I was I was in Benares, the place I go to usually. I was doing yoga exercises, half naked, and a big monkey with black face and long tail came and sat on the veranda. I woke, I was doing, I closed my eyes and I looked and there was this big monkey. He looked at me and I looked at her. It was a big monkey, so mm -hmm. they're powerful things. And it stretched out its hand. Mm. Just to, and I was, so I walked up and held her hand. Like that, held it. Held it. And it was rough, but very, very supple, extraordinary supple, <laughs> hmm? but rough. And we looked at each other, and it said, it wanted to come into the room. I said, look, I'm doing exercises, I have little time, would you come another day? I kind of talked to it, come another day. So he looked at me, and I withdrew, but went back. He stayed there for two or three minutes and gradually went away. 
Oh, marvelous! <laughs> Just marvelous. Uh, complete act of attention mm -hmm. between you. There was no sense of fear. It wasn't afraid. I wasn't afraid. A sense of, you know. You know, I was staying once in Kashmir, right among the hill mountains, and a group of monks came to see me, freshly bathed and everything, done all the ceremony and all that, they had come to see me. And they told me, they said they had just come from a group of uh, unworldly people who were super monks, who are very high up in the mountains. And I said, they're totally unworldly. I said, what do you mean by that word, sirs? He said, they've just left the world. They're no longer tempted by the world. And they have this great knowledge of the world. And I said, when they have left the world, have they left the memory of the world? the memory, the knowledge which the world has made, which the gurus have put together, the teachers. He said, that's wisdom. How can you leave wisdom? I said, you mean wisdom is bought through a book, through a teacher, from another, through sacrifice, torture, renunciation? You follow sir, their idea? That is, Wisdom is something you can buy from somebody else. Hmm? They went up the oh. mountain with all this baggage. Baggage, that's, right. that's exactly <laughs> what I said. All the baggage which, the, which you have put away, the world you have put away, but you carry their baggage. So that is really important thing to... If a mind is really very serious, to find out what religion means. Hmm? Not all this rubbish. I keep on repeating because that seems to be mounting, you know, growing. Mm -hmm. But to free the mind from all the growth, the Christians, and therefore, which means, see the accretions, see all the absurdities. It throws a very, very different cast on our word, worldly. Yes, that's just it. They're going up the mountain in order to leave the world, but they're taking immense pains to take it with them. Yeah, that's right. That's what they're doing when they go into the monastery. Of course, of course. It's okay. And I come back, and the mind be completely alone, not isolated, mm. not withdrawn, not build a wall around itself, say, and then I'm alone, <laughs> but alone in the sense that aloneness that comes when you put away all this, all the things of thought. Yesterday evening, I saw a boat going up the river at full sail, driven by the west wind. It was a large boat, heavily laden with firewood for the town. The sun was setting, and this boat against the sky was astonishingly beautiful. The boatman was just guiding it. There was no effort, for the wind was doing all the work. Similarly, if each one of us would understand the problem of struggle and conflict, then I think we would be able to live effortlessly, happily, with a smile on our face.
there is always death. There's a very good Italian proverb, but I won't go into it, which says everybody will die, I know. Perhaps I will too. <laughs> so, first, what is it we have to, un- to grasp, understand, go into, resolve? Life, the daily living, or the dying? And besides, why are we so terribly concerned about death? The speaker was walking once in the shaded road in India, and there were, he heard a chant behind him as he was walking towards the sea, and there was a dead body being carried by two men and his elder son carrying the fire in front of him, in front of the body. That's all. Not all the fuss and horses and flowers and, you know. It was a simple thing. It was really rather beautiful. The sun crying and chanting in Sanskrit, walking towards the sea where he was going to be cremated. And the fuss the Western world and makes about death, Rolls Royces. Enormous amount of flowers and so on. So, what, what are we concerned with? Living or dying? Mira, we can't work together. That's a fact. We can't think together. We don't seem to be able to do anything together unless we are forced, unless there's a tremendous crisis like war, then we all come together. If there's an earthquake, we all are in, involved in it. But remove the earthquakes, the great crises, wars, we are back into our separate little cells fighting each other. Right? This is so obvious. I saw a woman some years ago who was English, aristocratic and all the rest of it. During the war, they all lived in the underground, you know, the tube. And it, she said it was marvelous. We were all together, we, have, we supported each other. When the war is over, she went back to her castle and back, finished. Can we just look at this for a minute? When we say we are part of that, is it an idea or an actuality? Also, one observes, man has lost touch with nature. Oh, yes. Completely. Especially in big towns. Mm -hmm. And even in uh, small towns or hamlets, man is always outwardly going, outward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pursued by his own thoughts. Mm -hmm. And so he's more or less lost touch with nature. Nature means nothing to him. Yes, it's very nice, very beautiful. Once I was standing uh, with a few friends and my brother many years ago, of a Grand Canyon. Mm-hmm. Look at the marvelous thing. Yes. Incredible. The colors, the depth, and the shadows. 
and a group of people came and one lady says, yes, isn't it marvellous? And the next day, let's go and have tea. And so off they trotted. That too. <laughs> you, you follow? That yeah. is what is happening in the world. We have lost completely touch with nature. We don't know what it means. And also we, we kill. You follow? Mm-hmm. We kill for food. We kill for amusement. We kill what's called for sport. Hmm? We, I won't go into all that. Mm-hmm. So there is this lack of intimate relationship with nature. You are sitting there. The speaker is sitting up here. Only for convenience, not for authority. The platform doesn't give him authority. I must tell you a story, rather amusing. We were in India, in Bombay. One of some disciples of a guru came to see us. He said, You must meet him, he's an extraordinary man. He has achieved. He wants to, you to come to him. We urge you to come to him. I said, I, we said, I'm so sorry, I don't go out for chasing gurus. I was more polite. And after three or four days, they persuaded the guru to come. And we happened to be sitting on a mattress about two inches thick. Not if fifty centimeters or less than that. And when he came in, we got up naturally and offered him the mattress. He sat down there, took a position cross legged, and he became the authority because of that little height. <laughs> That's life. I come to you because you have you have certain authority, certain dress, certain uh, paraphernalia around you, and I come. I'm impressed by the dress, by the people, by the you know whole setup, and. You assure me that surrender yourself to me and I will save you. Right? Give yourself over to me, because I know you don't, so I will help you and I am only too willing and gullible. Because I want to be, I want comfort. I want some security. I want some hope somewhere on whom I can depend, in whom I have trust, in whom I know, or perhaps I think I know, that He will guide me, help me, and if He is only too willing to help. It begins very gently. There is the inner circle, the outer circle, and the outer and outer circles. And gradually, that help becomes dependence. And I depend on my guru, on my priest, on my leader, the political leader of all the various countries. I don't know why we are slaves to the politicians all over the world. I don't know if you have been inquired into it. We have elected them, or they have assumed power in the totalitarian states, and they put their thumb on you, and for the rest of your life you are stuck. 
all in the democratic world, it's every five years, seven years, you change. But it is the same. You elect them out of pure confusion, and there they are. They are confused, they, the game is played. Every seven years or five years this goes on. And it happens the same thing with the gurus. I don't like that guru, but I like the other one. He's more indulgent. He allows me to do what I like. <laughs> you know, many, uh, many gurus have come to see the speaker at many times. The funniest one of them was <laughs> he had been in that particular country for twenty for many years, and he came to see me with all the robes and beads and you know all the rest of it. And he said <laughs> he saluted me most respectfully because he assumed I was the guru of gurus. <laughs> and he said, Sir, I have been in this country for many years. I have talked all over the different parts of this country. I have a large number of followers. But I have run out of ideas. <laughs> So I've come to you, and so please give me some ideas. <laughs> I'm not, we're not joking, but this was an actual fact. You see, when we have really understood why we follow, why a guru assumes, himself, assumes authority, why he demands so many things, or allows me, allows another follower to throw off his inhibitions, doing what they like, sex, you know, the whole performance, ugliness of all that, I naturally feel that there is somebody who will help me. So why do I ask help of another? That's the real point. Apart from joking about all this, this is a very serious problem. Because they are multiplying, these gurus, with enormous work. Think of a religious man having enormous wealth and property, millions and millions of dollars, thousands of acres, hundreds and thousands of followers. What is wrong to allow such a thing to happen in a world that is already so utterly destructive? so degenerating, to allow the so-called religious people, who are really not religious, to acquire such wealth, such power. And they, because they have an enormous amount of money, they bribe, you follow? They slip through all the regulations and rules. So, why do we allow all this?
you have come to realize whatever you do is still the monkey. And therefore, always limited. You understand, sir? I'll tell you something, sir. I met a man, not met a man, I used to to know him. (coughs) He was a judge. And one day he said, I'm passing judgment, left and right, about crime and murder, all kinds of things, but I don't know what truth is. So he said to his family, I'm going away, I'm going to find it. He spent 25 years, I mean, these are facts, meditating, find out what truth is. So somebody came, brought him to one of the talks which I was giving, which is unimportant. And he came to see me afterwards. He said, I've 25 years, I've been mesmerizing myself. Deceiving myself. I haven't found truth. You understand? There it is. For an old man to realize that he has 25 years deluded himself. To admit that. You can't believe. You see, sir, when, I, when, you, when one actually faces the fact that you cannot do anything, monkey, the, the brain, the inside, apart from the rhythm, comes to say, quiet, says that. No tricks anymore. All religions have suppressed the senses, right? Face the facts, sir. Control your senses. Don't yield to it. The speaker was walking behind a group of sannyasis in Kashmir at one time. There was marvellous blue sky, clean air, lots of wild flowers. Air was scented with them. The smell of the hills and the groves and the valleys. The smell of the earth, the dew upon the earth. And these sannyasis in front, about a dozen of them, never looked at the trees. They had their head bent, chanting something or other, muttering, and never took notice of the beauty of the earth. Right? You've seen them, haven't you? Which you are doing too, don't it's not reserved to the sannyasis. It's not their special special privilege. And they never, never, for mile upon mile, never looked at the trees. You understand there was a stream flowing by. That stream was chattering, making music. The flow of that stream was the clear, unpolluted water. And the sannyasis never looked at that water. Nor the trees, nor the blue sky, nor the mountains covered with snow. Because sensory responses might lead to sex, might lead to all kinds of desires, right? Therefore, don't look. 
This happens also, sir, in the West, the monks. Right? You are following all this? Right, sirs? Am I telling a strange story? So, our religions, the religions throughout the world, have said, if you want to serve God, you must suppress your senses. You must control them. Shape them according to a precept or to a pattern laid down by the abbots and the priests and the sannyasis and the books, so that your senses are completely numbed. completely destroyed, right? Look what's happened to you, sirs. You never look at the skies, do you? The beauty of a tree, the light on a cloud, the new moon, just a slip of light. You never look at all that, do you? A person came to see me and his wife was dead. And he really thought he loved her. So I, he said, I must see my wife again. Can you help me? I said, which wife do you want to see? The one that cooked, the one that bore the children, the one that gave you sex, the one that quarrelled with you, the one that dominated you, frightened you. Hmm. Hmm? He said, I don't want to meet any of those. I want to meet the good of her. You follow, sir? Yes, 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 yes. The image of the good he has built out of her. Hmm. None of the ugly things, or what he considered ugly things, but the idea of the good which he had culled out of her, and that is the image he wants to meet. I said, Don't be infantile. <laughs> you are so utterly immature when you have stepped with her and got angry with her. All that you don't want, you want just the image which you have about her goodness. I said, and you know, sir, he began to cry, really cry for the first time. He said, afterwards, I have cried when she died, but the tears were of self-pity, my loneliness, my sense of, you follow, lack of things. Now I'm crying, I'm crying because I see what I have done. <laughs> you understand, sir? Once the speaker was standing, waiting for a bus in a long queue in London, a man with a bowler hat, Chapeau de Melon, walked all past the long queue, got in front, and the man next to him took his hat down, off his head, and passed it down. (laughs) And the man had to go back. But if the man was aware, he wouldn't have done it. But most of us are so concerned with our own problems, with our own, you know, all the muck that we have collected for generations, with that we are concerned. And intelligence, is something entirely different.
I talked to a monk once. He came to see me. He had a great many followers. And he was very well known. He's still very well known. And uh, he said, I have taught my disciples. He was very proud of having thousands of disciples. <laughs> 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 yes, yes. <laughs> and it seemed rather absurd for a guru to yes. be proud. He was a success. <laughs> he was a success. <laughs> <laughs> and success means Cadillacs or Rolls Royces, European and American followers. You follow all that circus that goes on. Yeah, and his gimmick works. Gimmick works. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he was saying, I have arrived because I have learned to control my senses, my body, my thoughts, my desires. Mm -hmm. I have held them, as the Gita says. Hold your, you know, something about a reining, you're riding a horse, you know, holding them. And he went on about it for some length. I, I said, Sir, what at the end of it? Hmm? You've controlled. Where are you at the end of it? He said, what are you asking? I have arrived. Arrived at what? I have achieved enlightenment. Just listen to it. So follow the, follow the sequence of a, thought, of a human being who has a direction hmm, which he calls truth. And to achieve that, there are the traditional steps. The traditional path, the traditional approach, and he has done it, and therefore he says, "I have got it. I've got it in my hand. I know what it is." I said, "All right, sir." He began to be very excited about it because he wanted to convince me about being a big man and all that. So I said, "Just we, we I sat very quietly and listened to him, and he quieted down, and then I said to him. We were sitting by the sea, and I said, do you see that sea, sir? He said, of course. Can you hold that water in your hand? When you hold that water in your hand, it's no longer the sea. It, right. Hmm? He couldn't make out. I said, all right. And the wind was blowing from the north, a slight breeze, cool. And he said, there's a breeze in there. Can you hold all that? No. Can you hold the earth? No. So what are you holding? Words? You know, sir, he was so angry. He said, I won't listen to you anymore. You are an evil man, and walked out. The monks that I have, who have come to see me, they are called sannyasis, they have come to see me, they are incredible. I mean, if I can tell you, um, a monk who came to see me some years ago, quite a young man, he left his house and home at the age of 15 to find God. And he had renounced everything, put on the robe. And as he began to grow older, at 18, 19, 20, sexual appetite was something burning. Mm -hmm. He explained to me how it became intense. He had taken a vow of celibacy as sannyasis do, monks do. And he said, day after day, in my dreams, in my walk, in my going to house, begging, this thing was becoming so, like a fire. Do you know what he did to control it? No, no. What did he do? He had it operated. Oh, for heaven's sake. Is that a fact? 
uh, that <laughs> sir, no, his urge for God was so. You follow, sir? Yes. The idea, yes. the idea, not the reality. Not the reality, no. So he came to see me. He had heard several talks which had given that place. He came to see me in tears. He said, now what have I done? You follow, sir? Oh, I'm sure, yes. What have I done to myself? I cannot repair it. I cannot <laughs> grow a new organ. It's finished. And we, oh, he was in such. That's the extreme. But it is, all control is in that direction. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm... Yes, uh, this, this is terribly dramatic. Uh, the one who's sometimes called the, the first Christian theologian, Origen, Origen yeah. uh, castrated himself yeah. uh, out of, as I understand it, uh, a misunderstanding of the words of Jesus. Uh, if your hand offends you, cut it off. I mean, so uh, that's authority incredible. to me is, is criminal in these directions. Doesn't matter who says it. And, and, and like the monk that, that you uh, just described, uh, Origen came later to repent of, of, of this in terms of seeing that it has nothing to do with anything. Mm. It's just a terrible thing. Uh, so, what, was this monk, if I may ask, um, also saying to you in his tears that uh, I've he, was, he was absolutely no better off in any way, shape, or form. I've, no, on the contrary, he said, I've committed a sin. I've committed an evil act. Yes, yes, of course, yes. He realized what he had done. Yes. That through that way, I mean, there is nothing. Nothing. Mm -hmm. I've, I've met so many not such extreme forms of control and mm, denial, but others, they have tortured themselves mm -hmm. for an idea, you follow, sir? For a symbol, for a concept. And we, I've, we've sat, I've sat with them and discussed with them, and they begin to see what they have done to themselves. So the mind must be totally and completely free. And till, till that comes about, don't meditate. You understand what I'm saying? Because it's meaningless. I remember, I'm, I'm sorry, I mustn't go into anecdotes, must I? Just this one. <laughs> we were watching from a window in Benares. A beggar dressed in saffron robes, that's the sannyasa robes in India. I don't know if you understand the word sannyasa, what that means. <laughs> I'll tell you presently what it means. He was dressed like that, and he was a poor, ordinary man, not very learned from his looks, from his talk. He was sitting, he sat under a tree and began to chant, sing, shout. The passers by looked at him and went away. Within a week, I assure you, I am not exaggerating. Within a week, he had garlands round his head. People stood round him, saluting him, giving him food, almost bending their knees in saying, what a great man you are. Do you understand? Within a week, this took place. And we are so gullible. 
right? So we are saying a mind that is free from all this, then comes meditation. The speaker recently talked, if I may most humbly point out, this not out of vanity, I'm informing you, he talked to the United Nations. I don't know why he was invited, but he went there. <laughs> and after the talk, one of the high authorities there said, I have come to the conclusion, conviction rather, that after 40 years working in this organization, I have come to the conclusion that I must not kill. Forty years it took him. You know, just see the significance of it. <clears throat> that it takes the human brain to come to some truth during forty years that is not to kill another human being. And the whole organization is based on not to bring about wars, prevent wars. They haven't done that, it's irrelevant. But the whole point is how the human brain refuses to face fact and act. And uh, we think that during time we resolve everything. That is, you rely or you seek God when you are depressed, when you are unhappy, when you want something, when you pray, right? Now, how do you find out if there is God or not? When you actually see Him. How do you actually see Him? No, you find about, uh, more about Him when you see Him, you know He exists. Do you remember that story of two Americans going to heaven? And they wander about the pla in heaven all over the place for weeks and months. And there is a sign that says God. And they go up that path. And one of them says, that's too much climb. You go up there and tell me all about it. So he goes up there. And says, comes back, rush back, my God, it's a woman. <laughs> right? Now, how do you know there is God? Because a hundred people say so? So just because a hundred people say that there is God doesn't mean it's true. For all you know, they might have heard from somebody else. Quite right. So, how do you know there is God? When you see Him. Huh? You see Him. Where do you see Him? And who created the world? Is God. And who created the world? He asks, if God didn't create the world, what do you mean by the world? The world. You, the trees, the fishes, the water, the frogs, the elephants, the lion, the... Huh? All matter. Huh? All matter. All matter. That is, all the rocks, the trees, the human beings, the valleys, <coughs> hmm? the rivers, everything is created, you think, by God. No, if it's not God, who, who else could be? If it's not God, he asks, who else could be? It could be some form of energy. How do you know? I'm just guessing. Guessing. 
That's what they're all doing. <laughs> and so somebody guesses much more seriously, it's in their ears. <laughs> and then you accept it. Suppose you don't accept your tradition that there is God, then what will you do? How will you find out? You know that there are a whole group of community or monks who are perpetually praying. One group finishes praying, the other group takes it up. And we also pray when we are in difficulties. When there is this great crisis in our life, we want to Pray or say, somebody help me, please. You know that joke of a man hanging onto a cliff? Uh, he says, Please, God, save me. And God says, Have faith and jump. And the man who is hanging on to cliff, he say, says, isn't there somebody above that still? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Why do we pray at all? <coughs> this has been going on, praying, in the Christian world, in the Islamic world, in a, in a different way, Buddhist and Hindu world, pray. To whom are you praying? To an outside agency? Outside agency being God or the Lord? The Lord according to different countries and cultures and tradition, the Almighty of different concepts. To whom are we praying? And why do we pray? Does prayer answer our difficulties? In some cases, when you are praying, not merely using certain words, chanting and so on, but praying silently without word. Do you understand what I'm saying? Perhaps you might have an answer, because your whole brain has become quiet. And in that quietness, in that stillness of the brain without movement of thought, you find an answer. There is a marvellous story in the Upanishads of India Good story. You won't go into it, that story? Of course, of course. <laughs> Anything to divert us, move away from ourselves. A Brahmana, you know what a Brahmana is? Of course. In India, in the ancient days, was giving away everything he had. It used to be old tradition that when you have gathered some things for five years, through work, through all that, after five years you must give everything away. 
You understand? Do it. <laughs> Which means never gather anything, right? So that we have nothing to give away. He's giving away his cattle, his house, there are various things, and he has a son. And the son comes to him and says, Father, you are giving away everything, and whom will you give me to? You understand? Whom, whom are you going to give me? To whom are you going to give me? And the father said, Please go away, you're too childish, you don't ask this question. But the boy comes back several times and ultimately says, Father, tell me, to whom are you going to give me? Father, by now, is very angry and says, I'm going to send you to death. And being a Brahmana, he must keep his word. So he sends the boy away. That's the fourth tray, third tray, fourth. <laughs> so the boy goes from one teacher to another on the way to death. One guru, one teacher says, you live after death. Through many lives, you ultimately come to the highest principle. And he goes to another teacher and he says, I am going to the house of death. What is there after? There is nothing after. This is annihilation. So he goes on and ultimately arrives at the house of death. And when he arrives, death is absent. You understand this? See the beauty of it, sir, you understand? Death is absent. So he waits for three days. So on the third day, death comes and says, As you are a Brahmana, I apologize for keeping you waiting. <laughs> and since you are come this long distance, I give you, I offer anything you like. Women, palaces, wealth, anything you want. And the boy says, I may have all those, but at the end of it I'll meet you. Right? You'll always be there. Whatever gift you give me, you'll always be there. And the death says, you are a marvellous person to avoid all this and seeking truth. So he goes into the question, I have not read the story myself, people have told me, goes into the question of time, self and the ending of the self. You understand? That's the story. So it peters out. But that is the story. So I'm ask, we are asking, can we give away anything that we hold dear? Like that gentleman asked, I have listened to you for a number of years and there is nothing. I must tell you a lovely story about this. A pupil goes to a teacher and says, Teach me what is truth. And he says, All right, stay with me. We'll talk, we'll, conver we'll have a conversation about the universe, about the beauty of land, and so on, so on. We'll talk, and perhaps you will see truth. So the teacher talks to him every day, 
and goes into various things. At the end of fifteen years, he says, Master, I've lived with you for fifteen years, watched you, listened to you, see you how you act, do this and do that, but I haven't got truth. So I'm leaving you. There's a man in a few miles further away where I'm going to learn from him the truth. So this is, the teacher says, certainly. So he's away for five years and comes back to the original teacher and he says, I've found it. And he says, Really? Have you found it? Yes. He said, There is that river. They were standing by the banks of the river. There is that river. And I can walk across it. I found it. He said, the teacher then says, You have taken five years to learn this and more? Yes. And the teacher says, There is a boat, if you pay a cent or a you will cross it. Right? Got it? Most of us are like that. We pay enormous efforts to do things where it's so simple. One saw a bird die, shot by a man. He was flying with a rhythmic beat and beautifully, with such freedom and lack of fear. And the gun shattered him and fell to the earth, dead, and all the life had gone out of it. A dog fetched it. And the man had collected other birds, dead birds. And he was chattering with his friend and seemed so utterly indifferent. All that he was concerned with, he had brought down so many birds. And it was all as far as he was concerned. They are killing all over the world those marvelous, rather great animals of the sea, the whales. They are killed by the million. The tiger and all the other animals are now becoming endangered species. Man is the only animal that is to be dreaded. Some time ago, staying with a friend high in the hills, a man came and told the host that a tiger had killed last night a cow. And would we like to see the tiger again? See the tiger that evening. He could arrange it by building a macha on a platform on a tree and tying a goat. On the bleat of the goat, the small animal would attract the tiger and we could see it. We both refused to satisfy cruelly our curiosity. But later on that day, the host suggested that we get to the car and go into the forest to see the tiger if we could. And so, towards the evening, we got into the car, into an open car, with a chauffeur driving, and we went into the forest for several miles deep into the woods. Of course, we saw nothing. But it was getting quite dark and the headlights were on. As we turned round a bend, there it was, sitting right in the middle of the road, waiting to receive us. It was a very large animal, beautifully marked, and its eyes, caught by the headlights, were bright, scintillating. And he came growling towards the car, and as it passed by, 
just few inches from my hand, from my, from the hand that was stretched out. The host said, "Don't touch it; it's too dangerous. Be quick, or it's faster than your hand." But you could feel the dynamic energy of that animal, its vitality. It's a great dynamo of energy. And as it passed by, one felt an enormous attraction towards it, and it just disappeared into the woods. Apparently, my friend had seen many tigers, and had helped long ago in his youth to kill one. And ever since then, he has been regretting the terrible act and. Cruelty in every form is now spreading in the world. Man has never been so bestial, cruel, that probably he is now so violent. When I have talked, at least the churches and the, and the priests of the world have talked about peace on earth from the Christian highest hierarchy. And the poor village priest has talked about living a good life, not hurting, not killing a thing, especially among the Buddhists and the Hindus at the end of the former years. They said, especially among certain group of people in India, don't kill the fly, don't kill anything. For next life, you'll pay for it. It was rather crudely put, but the intention not to kill and not to hurt another human being. Some of them maintained and sustained this spirit, but killing was was going on and is going on. The dog kills so quickly the rabbit, or the man shoots another. These marvelous machines. And is perhaps he is himself shot by another. And this has been going on for millennia upon millennia. Some treat it as a sport; others kill out of hatred, anger, jealousy. Others kill an organized murder of the various nations with their arms. And one wonders if man would ever live on this. Beautiful earth, peacefully, never killing a little thing, or being killed or killing another, to live peacefully with some dignity and love with his heart. Now we've talked for an hour, and what good has it done? Not that one is seeking a result. I'm not. The speaker is not. I don't care if you do or don't. It's up to you. So, after listening for an hour, perhaps to this harangue or to this sermon, you know that story of a preacher. Talking to the, his disciples every morning, that was his habit. He would get up on the prostrum, talk to his disciples for about ten quarter an hour or an hour, and begin the day that way. So one morning he was preaching, talking about goodness of life, how to behave. A bird comes and sits on the. Window sill, and the preacher stops talking, and they all listen to that bird, and the bird flies away, and the preacher says, "The sermon is over for this morning." Right? Got it? <laughs> May I get up now? <laughs> 